way back before the pandemic began, I had a question. What does it take for a city person to go country? In 2015, I set out to explore through photography, writing, and now this podcast. In February, I recorded most of the interviews for the first season. I had planned to launch in April of 2020, the five-year anniversary of the project. But then, everything turned upside down, and it just didn't feel like the right time to launch because so much had changed overnight. As the initial shock of the pandemic wore off, it became clear that many people with the means to do so were leaving cities in droves. Recent data has shown that nearly 16 million people have relocated in the U.S. this year, making the concept of an urban exodus even more relevant. So while some of the interviews in this season were conducted before the pandemic, the topics they discuss, the questions they raise, and the answers they provide are more urgent than ever. I'm Melissa Hessler. Welcome to the Urban Exodus. How far would you go to take control of your health? A battle with cancer was the catalyst that propelled Jason and Lorraine Contreras to overhaul their lives and hone in on what would truly make them happy and healthy. They downsized their expenses, left their careers, sold most of their belongings, and moved from the suburbs outside of Los Angeles to an acre of land in rural North Carolina. Although quitting their jobs and moving across the country, away from their family and friends, wasn't an easy decision. They couldn't imagine returning to the lives that they led before. They have found their bliss, living simply and enjoying the hard work and daily rhythms of country life. As I walk out first thing in the morning, the chickens greet me ready to be fed. It's a crisp fall morning, a slight breeze, and I see the sun peeking over, and that first sunlight is about ready to hit the chicken coop. I'll open up the greenhouse and get it watered for the day. How we ended up here was about 10, well, actually, it's almost 11 years ago now um, in California. You know, we're from the Los Angeles area. So about about 11 years ago now, I was diagnosed with cancer. And we started thinking differently ever since then, like kind of really kind of taking our own health in our own hands kind of and just figuring out, okay, what do we need to change? You know, do we need to start eating healthier? And so, you know, I did six months of chemo and that kind of started us on this journey. And I remember one of the last times I went to my oncologist, I asked her, you know, she said I was in remission. I'm done. I'm no more chemo. I asked her like, hey, so what do I need to be doing now? Is there any, some kind of protocol or any kind of nutrition plan that I need to be following? And she had told me just no, you know, just go back doing what you were doing. Just go back living your life you know, almost like nothing happened. And I just felt, we we kind of felt like that just wasn't a good answer for us because it just just didn't make sense. Like, how can we go back living how we normally lived? But because it was just such a, uh, an emotional time for us of that whole process. And so that's when we just started thinking about nutrition and, and health. And that kind of got us to like, hey, let's figure out what things we need to be cutting out out of our diet and what what things we need to be eating. And then we started slowly like maybe we should grow our own food. And then then from there, we kind of like started talking about, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could find a little bit more land, maybe raise pastured poultry, maybe raise our own chickens, maybe have a cow. I don't know. (laughs) It was kind of like almost like a joke that we would tell ourselves and like, well, one day we're going to go find some land someday. And and it kind of just – It was weird because we kept on talking about it. At first, it was kind of a joke. But the more we talked about it, the more we started to really want it. And slowly, you know, we had a four-bedroom house. And we started to get rid of stuff, like try to like pare down. And just, you know, after going through cancer, just things didn't matter anymore. We felt like, you know, we had we, we were big collectors of things. And... We loved our things. <laughs> I mean, Lorraine, you, you know, she was in the fashion industry. Mm, and I had lots of boxes of clothing. 
put away for seasons in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so we started slowly getting rid of things and just and also saying like, well, if we're going to go buy land somewhere and become farmers, you know, we're not going to need, you know, these collectible movie posters. <laughs> you know, we're not going to need all this fancy clothes. <laughs> How long would you say that process of removing, decluttering, starting to grow food in your backyard, how many years did you do that before you really, it became not a joke and you started searching for land? Well, it was all little baby steps. So, right. I mean, that what happened over a, a couple years of time. Was it three? Maybe three, three years. Three or four years, maybe. Yeah, three or four years. And it was just all baby steps. One one little step here, and then yeah, we, you talked about it. And we really enjoyed getting rid of our things. Yeah, it's almost it's you know people say like they enjoy buying things, like it's kind of like a rush. <laughs> but but there's also the other way too. Mm -hmm. Like when you start getting rid of stuff, like there's like oh man, that was you know that was great. I feel was, was weightless relief. now. Yeah. yeah, there was almost this feeling of like we don't have this burden of of things on our back anymore. Like we just feel so free and weightless. Like we could go anywhere. Like maybe we could move to North Carolina. And eventually that's exactly what they did. Lorraine and Jason packed up their lives in California and moved with their daughter Penelope to a small plot of land close to Asheville. They decided to homeschool right from the start. And I was curious about their experience and advice on the topic, especially these days when many parents, myself included, are fumbling their way through teaching their kids at home. I know when I was there, we discussed a little bit the, the socializing challenges associated with homeschooling. Can you talk a bit about how you've had to be intentional about scheduling times for her to play with other kids her age? And have you been able to find some good homeschooling communities locally that have helped mitigate any potential feelings of isolation for the three of you? Finding a good homeschooling community was important to us. And when we chose North Carolina, we saw that there was a great homeschooling community out here and there's multiple of them. So if, if one didn't work out, we could, you know, choose from. We also belong to many other different types of communities out here where there's like homesteading, homeschooling, our church, the artist communities. So we have all of these pockets of communities that we belong to and everybody has children. So we are intentional about getting together, but that just comes naturally. I think like you want to be hospitable and open up your home and and she has these really great friendships that have developed out of all of these little pockets of different communities. And she's totally aware that, you know, maybe these kids, they, they go to school and we see them during this time, or maybe these other kids over here are homeschooled and we gather during this time. And we do a lot of things together. And that's, what's great about the homeschooling community is you can always just say, Hey, want to get together at noon or at 10 o'clock in the morning and everyone's available. So it's great. There's a lot of sociability in there. I know that Penelope was four when you moved. What changes have you seen in her since you've made the move from Southern California to North Carolina? Well, one really funny one is when we lived in California, she was really into Disney princesses. <laughs> and well, when I first found out I was having a girl, I was like, she's not going to be in, she's not going to have any Barbies. <laughs> she's not going to be into Disney princesses. But all of our family had a lot of influence yeah. on that. And I couldn't help it. She was around family and they would be like, oh, look, we bought you this Disney Barbie, you know, and I'd be like, oh, no, that's not what I had planned for her. <laughs> so she was and then they would buy her the Disney princess ball gowns. And so with the little glass slippers. And so she had tons of those little dress up ball gowns. And then when we moved here, we'd be outside in the garden and chasing the chickens and she, her little dresses would snag. And she just kind of, I think on her own, realized that these dresses were not practical. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she she's not really into that anymore. No. She's into like gardening, raising chickens and like, she's into like running a business. <laughs> yeah. She, yeah. She has like her cowboy boots on. Yeah. Like she's getting dirty. Oh yeah. She has a typewriter that she's really into right now. She's writing novels and newsletters. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> she she is such a cool kid. I mean, just one of like a real gem. I just still vividly remember her from our visit. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the changes you two have noticed in yourselves, health and happiness wise, since shifting to a rural life? 
and a more minimalist life as well? In California, I had an office job and I, I would be there. It was seven, about 17 years I had this office job and, you know, just, just being in an in, in office and, and sitting down in front of a computer for that long, doing the same exact thing. That's one of the reasons that like what drove us kind of to this lifestyle was I wanted to be out of that office and wanted to move around and doing stuff. So since moving here, I have not been in the office back to the office since. And I feel a, a lot more healthier as far as like, I mean, when I was working in the office, I, I fell in love with like running. Like I was a trail runner and I was any chance I get I would after work, I would just go running. And since moving here, I haven't really kept that up, but I still feel like 10 times healthier. I feel like I'm more even physically like, yeah, I may not be able to run 20 miles, <laughs> you know, 10 miles even. But I feel like an overall physical health, I feel a whole lot better because I feel like I'm just, I'm always moving around. I, I'm I'm not sitting down so much and I'm just, I'm making things with my hands and, and I'm moving things and I'm, you know, standing up, sitting down, you know, like just all overall workout almost. So I, I, th- I feel definitely, I feel even not only like in physically, I feel better, but like even mentally, I, f- I just feel happier, I think, uh, just because I maybe I'm doing all these things and I'm doing what I love doing. Mm-hmm. And I have to agree too. It's the same on every other level too for, for like family wise, like we are working together as a family towards this ultimate goal of sustainability, growing our own food, having this business and being together as a family. And I feel like we're all working together. So there's like this purpose, you know, that we have. And so I, I it, it does bring happiness and it does bring an overall sense of more, uh, more healthier way of living you found a purpose in life, which I think everybody is searching for in some degree or another. Both of your extended families still live in Southern California. Was it challenging to make the decision to move so far away? And were they supportive of your decision initially? It was very challenging. Like it was so hard. Like we struggled with that for like years while we were making that decision. Like we tried to find a homestead in Southern California or even Northern California or even like a nearby state. Just even like a day's drive. mm -hmm. (laughs) Because yeah, I mean, it's important. Having family nearby is so important, but. Yeah, it was, it was a struggle because like all, like pretty much all of our family live within an hour from each other in California, like everybody. Like within 30 minutes of each other. Yeah. Like it, it just so. We saw each other often. Yeah. I mean, it's so common that grandma would just stop by on the weekend and just pop in and say hi or or mom, you know, and like we have barbecues with family like every weekend. And when we decided to move. Everyone was shocked. I I think think everyone was just like, what? Eventually their family came to accept their decision, especially seeing how much the change in their lifestyle had caused such a positive shift. For Jason and Lorraine, another big part of setting up their homestead was documenting the journey itself, the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of setting up a whole new lifestyle in an unfamiliar part of the country. They decided to share these helpful videos on their Sow the Land YouTube channel. What positives have come out of sharing your journey, and have there been any negatives that you've faced? Uh, the positives is that I'm hoping that we can say we have encouraged. Oh, no, we have. We have encouraged so many people uh, to start growing their own food. Yes. Um, and people who were on the fence about homesteading or maybe leaving their family to go homestead, maybe we've encouraged them to make that leap. Um, and you know, there's been families who've reached out to us and showed us pictures that because of you, I started a garden or because of you, we're canning beans. <laughs> right. And I would hope so like our, the videos that we post to be like, Hey, we're just regular people. Mm-hmm. You know, like we didn't know how to do this stuff when we moved here. I didn't do any of this stuff. If we could do it, anybody could do this. Mm-hmm. You know, I just, I would hope that that's how we would portray ourselves. Like, you know, because we're just nobody special and just, hey, we're just regular folks like you guys just trying to make it work. So this is hopefully what we're showing you can help you do what you want to do. But so, yeah, I mean, I definitely think there's a lot more positives. And then the negatives, I mean, 
there's a little bit of negativity. Yeah, there. we're in the public eye. So I think everybody has an opinion. <laughs> we haven't had too much negatives, no, negative it, opinions. It's actually though. been really everything that we post. Yes. Uh, it, it's except like, yeah, 10 times positive, but you know, it Every is now and then you'll sprinkled get sprinkled so in there with negativity. <laughs> you'll get one grouchy person. <laughs> and it's just people, you know, judging us for some things that we're doing, but we can't let that little negativity stop us from doing things. Mm -hmm. Was there a big learning curve required to create the content that you create now? And what are some of your favorite tools you found along the way to help you assist in the production, documentation, and distribution of what you're creating on the farm? Yeah, I think it's definitely a learning curve. Well, especially for YouTube. I mean, we've always been on Instagram and, and that's where we first started sharing kind of our story and our journey was through Instagram. And then we started um, doing videos on YouTube and I totally understand, you know, people don't like being in front of a camera. And so I feel like that was a learning curve for me is like oh, yeah. seeing myself on camera, hearing my voice on camera. When we very first did it, started the YouTube channel, I did not. I mean, I still to this day kind of like shrink back from the camera, but but in the beginning, it's seeing yes. myself, it's, it's really hard. You think you look a certain way. And then when you watch the playback, you're like, oh, I don't look like that at all. And I don't sound like that. And wow, I didn't want my hair to look like that. Or I I broke out or maybe I gained a little bit of weight this week. You know, so <laughs> it's, it's very humbling. It's yes, it very is. humbling to put yourself out there. And then I feel like over time, We've just kind of learned, okay, this is what I look like. This is what I sound like. People are just going to have to love me <laughs> for who I really am. Yeah. That's all it is, really. Yeah. And just being, you know, we were over over 520 some videos that we've had all together. If you do that many videos, you should improve. Yeah. So. And get more comfortable in front of being in front of the camera. Right. And so, like, if you look at it, our, like, very first uh, early videos, it's like a totally different channel than what it is now, I feel. And that's just us being more comfortable, even and, also the editing yeah, I was and say stuff the like editing. that. Like, the editing is different. So, so yeah, that was definitely a learning curve there, just being in front of the camera. and um, But like over time, you just kind of learn to just say, hey, yeah, th this is who we are and this is us and this is our story. This season of the Urban Exodus podcast is brought to you by Jake.Art. Bring the beauty of the outdoors in. Search their collection of affordable, high-quality fine art prints by color or theme to find just the right work for your home or office. Whether you need a visual escape into the beauty of the natural world while stuck indoors, or want to send a thoughtful gift over the holidays, Jake.Art, that's J-A-K-E dot A-R-T has you covered. Enter the code Urban Exodus, all one word, at checkout for 15% off your order now through January 1st. Do you think that there is, um, you know, a small movement underway of a lot of people who are considering making a major lifestyle change? And maybe that's part of the success of, of your channel and, and your sharing of your story? I think for sure. And there's a lot of people trying to find a more healthier way to live. They want to grow their own food and they want to have a part in that. Like they want to be able to have control. I do think people are searching for just a change, mm -hmm. whatever it is. I think, I think another big aspect of it is the community aspect. Oh yeah. Of, for sure. of people are searching for community. There's a lot of people searching for a community right now. When they see that online is when you ha you have a community, they kind of want to be a part of that, this yeah. greater movement and um, you know everyone growing their own food or eating healthy and knowing what's in your food and this like change to stop the standard American diet. And I think they want to feel part of that. Do you have advice for rural businesses and farms wanting to leverage social media to expand their customer base and build community? I think it's all about just sharing your story because I, I think there's a lot of people that don't think they have anything to talk about. So, you know, I don't know what I'm going to post on Instagram. I don't know what I'm going to post on social media, but like, man, like so many people have an incredible story. Everybody has it. Like, especially if you're in this farming homesteading space, everybody that we've met 
have incredible story to tell on how they became doing what they're doing. And I think we have to remember that. And, 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 or they might, or somebody might think like, well, I'm not doing anything special. Yeah. I'm farming, but you know, maybe I, I'm not doing anything that the other guy's doing, you know, but, but I also think it's, well, it's your perspective. There's, there's a lot of other people sharing what they're doing on their homestead, just like us, but we're coming at it at a different perspective than anybody else. And so is the, the next person. They, they have their own perspective. Everyone has their own perspective. And so I think when we share that and, and think of that and, and really believe in your heart and that, that what you're saying is truthful and you believe it and you're passionate about it, I mean, people will respond to those things. You have this whole side business that you created with the success of your YouTube channel. Let's talk a little bit about the products that you create. Have you seen sales increase from creating this community online? When people get to know us on YouTube or they feel that they know us, whether it be YouTube or Instagram, and we're con- our presence is strong there and they, f- they feel like they know us. And I feel like that creates a whole nother level of marketing is people want a piece of you. They want to, one, they want to support you because they know you. Maybe they've fallen in love with you and your story and they want to support your family. But two, they feel like they know you and they, they almost want to take a piece of you home. And so that's, I feel like that's been very helpful for our business. A common theme in country life is letting go of traditional full-time employment and instead building a steady income stream from multiple sources. What are the creative ways you've been able to make this non-traditional multifaceted work model sustainable for your family? Yeah, that that has been a difficult learning experience, I think, too, coming from an office job where you know, you get paid every Friday. (laughs) That's, that's the draw from it. Like, Oh, but I get paid every Friday, you know? So (laughs) I think the first month we were here was when it really affected me because I was like, man, I haven't got paid in a month, (laughs) you know, like, cause when we moved here, I, I didn't have a job. Like there was no job waiting for us. There was nothing. We just moved. And so that first month was just like, man, this is weird. Like it was so scary, you know, I haven't got paid in a month. And then like maybe the next month, oh, I only got paid once this month, you know, <laughs> and just, just, ha- just, and, and again, I think it's just a mind mindset thing where I had to trust the process and really just trying to be more creative and like, and, and also I think it's important to listen to the people that who's following you mm-hmm. because we started selling Bernice t-shirts and Bernice is our, our one of our egg laying chickens. Yeah, mm-hmm. every morning in our, well, in our YouTube channel, like I'll say, hey, good morning, Bernice. You know, and that was just unexpected. Like, this is how I talked to Bernice, right? And I started, <laughs> I started putting it in our videos. N- no, not on purpose, just kind of like that's what I said that day. And people really started responding to that. Like, oh my gosh, I love how you say good morning to Bernice. And they're like, Bernice needs her own t-shirt. And I would think. At first we were like, no, no way. Who chicken, is going to buy like, a Bernice t-shirt? Yeah. But then I was like, okay, I'm going to try it. So then I we made up a logo kind of of Bernice and it says, hey, Bernice t-shirt. And I was like, all right, I'm going to I'm gonna respond to these people. These people say they're going to buy a Bernice t-shirt. I'm going to make a Bernice t-shirt. So I did. And it ended up being like one of our best-selling t-shirts. And it still is. And, and that's just, you know, just paying attention, I guess, to the people that are following you. It's like, what, what do they want? You know? <laughs> I've been wondering about this because it's a question that I frequently get, and I know it differs from state to state, but what about healthcare? I know that obviously you battled cancer and there are a lot of checkups involved to make sure you stay in remission. Did you do a lot of research before you moved and was a healthcare system that would work if you were self-employed part of what you were thinking about when you were looking for places to live? Yeah, we do definitely get that question a lot too. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't want the healthcare issue to be the reason why we don't do this thing, you know, that we don't move here or that we don't quit our jobs. Like, you know, I just didn't want that to be a reason. And I, I think for a lot of folks that that is a, a reason, Oh, there's, I don't know about healthcare, you know? And so uh, we didn't want that to affect us. And so we just made the move and we did a little bit of research, I think, mm-hmm. but I think when we first moved here, we had f- free healthcare. Because we weren't making anything, which was great. I mean, it was not ideal. It's not where we wanted to be, but like it helped. Mm-hmm. 
and that is an option. Mm-hmm. And then most of our homestead type friends, they just pay out of pocket. They're just pay as you go. And right. then um, eventually we decided to join a sharing group. It's a health community sharing group. I know things happen, but like, you know, it just, we just didn't want to let that stop us from doing what we want to do. You know, like we never would have left. Do you have people that you trade with locally? Do you sell any of the produce or chickens that you raise on your land or have a trade system in place for things that you don't raise? Slowly, we've been um, selling some of the pasture poultry that we raise here. Um, And every year, it seems like we're selling more and more. And that was kind of like our goal when we first moved here was to sell pasture poultry and raise chickens for meat. And we do some trading. Um, Like we've traded people for like, like I've done, um, there's these like art wall hangings that I do. Like we've traded uh, friends for like, they they really like this wall hanging. They're like, hey, we have, you know, an abundance of uh, grass fed lamb or something like that. So I was like, I'll trade you an art piece for, for some lamb. (laughs) <laughs> and you know it's it's cool like like it's, it's nice to do that sometimes we'll trade some greens maybe like our greens didn't do well one year and, and you know our friends did but then we have like all this pasture poultry in our freezer you know and we'll trade you this for that so i mean that's what's great when you have a community around you you know you don't necessarily have to do all the things you know we could trade you know milk if we wanted to you know we don't have to have a milk cow <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Hessler Creative Workshops, a creative duo, spoil alert, it's my husband and I, offering both visual and destination photography workshops. Join us in our Creative Connection course running January 8th through 9th. Creative Connection meets once a week for group critiques paired with lectures and assignments designed to inspire, experiment, and expand your artist's eye. Learn more and see our full list of virtual and destination workshops at HesslerCreative.com. What advice would you give to people who want to build a healthier life for themselves, but maybe they don't have any savings or they're living paycheck to paycheck? What are some small things they can do to start on this path? I think probably gaining, trying to gain as much knowledge as you possibly can, whether that be listening to podcasts Mm -hmm. or watching YouTube videos. And there's always community gardens that you can find and get connected with and, you know, just volunteer your time with that. and. Um, start where you're at. I think you've mentioned that plenty of times mm-hmm. in our um, podcast is is start where you're at. Do what you're, you know, you can grow food anywhere on a back porch in a kitchen right. window seal. And I think, I think sometimes like, I, so I get this question from people that they're like, I, I don't have community. Like I don't, I don't know anybody around me that is growing food or, or is into like a more healthy lifestyle or, you know, my family's not into it. How do I find community? And I think what's important is like maybe you need to create that community. You know, instead of trying to search for it, maybe you're the one to create it. Maybe you just, I don't know, print out a piece of paper, put it at the local library and or the post office or local post office or something and say, hey, you know, we're going to have a, pot- a potluck is yeah, great. Potluck. <laughs> They're a thing. They're a thing out here. I mean, we- that's how we knew like yeah. – that's how we met a lot of our friends that we have now is right. through a potluck. Yeah, we got invited to so many, and we always said yes to every potluck we got invited to. <laughs> yeah, and and maybe yeah, maybe you need to have a potluck and just say, hey, I want to have a potluck, and just invite your neighbors over and your friends, and then next thing you know, or maybe you're you're starting that little garden, and and maybe you want to have another. Maybe invite other people to see what you're doing, and then maybe that other person is feeling inspired by that. Maybe that one tomato plant that you're growing, and maybe that's creating your own community. I love that. You can just start where you're at. That makes complete sense. What are some of the most commonly asked questions that you get on social media that you can respond to here? Um, we get a lot of "How can I move to Asheville?" questions. Yes, and like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like realtor type questions. Realtor type questions, <laughs> like like how much is land? Yeah, and ca- can I put a house anywhere? And, and how much is a septic system? And <laughs> <laughs> we, I don't know if we can answer those. Well, questions. I know I don't know these questions. I don't know these answers at all. Yeah, like you have to talk to a realtor. A lot of times I refer them to like, well, 
I don't know a realtor, but you can contact a realtor because I, I really don't know. Like, I don't know if they assume like, because we live here, we know these things, but like, I don't keep track of how much these things cost. Yeah. That's probably one of the most questions we get or like finding moving questions. I think a lot of people, they do contact us saying, what do we do? (laughs) (laughs) Like, how are we able to live this life? And you know, I, these are the same questions, though, that we would have For before sure. we were living this life. You know, we'd have these questions. And-, and they're real honest questions because I remember you and I, like, talking about that. We had we knew a couple people who homestead, and we were like, what do they do for – like, how do they get an income? I think the idea of – not receiving a paycheck every single week. Like that was just too far. We were so far removed from that. If they don't have this company that's going to hand them a paycheck every Friday, where are they going to get their money? (laughs) Right, right. We couldn't wrap our minds around that, I think. And then it wasn't until we moved here and then we started meeting other people who just kind of Said yes to everything. <laughs> yeah, who are doing this lifestyle mm-hmm. where we realize that oh, it's just hard work. Mm-hmm. Like it really is saying yes to everything, living season by season. You know, I've met people that they work at a coffee shop one season and the next season they're cutting down trees. If you could be transported back to the beginning of your journey before you moved, is there anything that you wish you would have had set up in advance? I think for sure, I would have told us to start YouTube now. Yeah, much earlier because we didn't document. <laughs> or, or, or even just creating content on Instagram. We weren't really doing that prior. We had just started the Instagram right before we left. Yeah, I would have said you need to create more content. I would have loved to see us have documented our move. The whole process of us talking about selling our house, getting rid of our things, and showed what that looked like. But now we talk, we talk, we can only talk about it and show maybe show a few pictures. But like I think for YouTube, people are so visual. I think that a lot of people would have liked to see that and hopefully would have been cheering us on. Yeah, because <laughs> we time. didn't we didn't start YouTube till almost a year after we moved here. Mm-hmm. So I think I would have told myself that you need to start creating this content now and, and sharing this journey because Honestly, we were scared when we moved here. <laughs> you know, like we really didn't know if we could even make it. Like, <laughs> like I was afraid of the failure. Honestly, like I didn't want to be afraid of that, but I was afraid of that. I, I was afraid of just what if we fail and then and I'm talking about it on Instagram or online and people are going to know that I'm failing. I had these feelings of like of being afraid and being embarrassed and, and what if we don't make it? But then... At a certain point, I started, I think I started to realize like, we need to be not afraid of these things of of the failure. This journey that we're on is just our story. It's just our journey. This is, this is what we're doing. It's real. Do you think that where you are now is your forever home or do you have plans to relocate ever in the future? Or or what are, what are some of your goals and plans that you're envisioning for the next couple of years? This, where we're at now, was never in, intended for us to be our forever home. It was always just kind of like our starter home, homestead, where it's just going to get us out here and we're just to get us starting and to get us going and get us dirty and, and learning stuff. And to see if we could actually make it. <laughs> yeah, and to see if we actually even like it, you yeah. know? And so that's why how we always treated this this area that we're in now. And so, yeah, definitely our, our goal is to eventually find more some more land, something a little bit bigger. We definitely like the area. We'll probably I would I would hope that we could stay in the area, but I also would hope we could find something where we could grow. I think just now we're pretty much maxed out on almost maxed out on using the entire piece of land we have here. And I think in order for us to grow as like just as people and just as for our business, we need to find something a little bit bigger. So that is our goal eventually. I initially spoke with Jason and Lorraine back in February of 2020. Since the pandemic, they have seen a lot of growth in their online community as more and more people have become interested in becoming more self-sufficient. They sent me this brief audio postcard to tell us what they've been up to since we last talked. This summer has been... One of our busiest summers since we've been, it's been uh, four and a half years now, over four and a half years that we've been in North Carolina. 
and it's been our busiest summer as far as growth. We doubled what we normally grow, so we raised over 120 pasture-raised poultry, chickens, and two pigs. And just figuring that out on our one and a half acres, I never thought growing that much meat was possible on one and a half acres. This year was supposed to be a year that we travel. I mean, we're booked to speak at different affairs and stuff. And, you know, with everything going on, it all got canceled. And so that kind of forced us home. A plus side to us being home is that we were able to grow more food. And we are also able to focus more on our business and create more YouTube content. People that I never, that I kind of knew, like that I remained friends, like even from high school, like they were contacting me and people I didn't know that even followed us. And they were like, hey, I'm building a raised garden bed. How do you do this? And, or how do you do that? It, it was busy in that aspect. I would hope that we can continue to learn and, and try to figure this stuff out of how to grow more food or at least know where your food comes from and, and know your farmer or buy from a local farm. And for us, I see our future is definitely, hopefully we could do more hands-on workshops because I think people really benefit from that. And that brings a lot of value to somebody when they want to take it to the next level. But I do wish everyone a happy and healthy new year as we all continue to move forward. That was Jason Contreras at their Sow the Land homestead in North Carolina. I hope you enjoyed listening to my conversation with Jason and Lorraine and feel inspired by their story of minimizing their life to maximize their health and happiness. To read Jason and Lorraine's Urban Exodus feature from 2018 and see photos of their beautifully updated mobile home and farmstead, visit urbanexodus.com. You can follow their journey on Instagram or YouTube at Sow the Land and see their woodworking and apothecary products on their website, sowtheland.com. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at The Urban Exodus. To read more in-depth features on folks who ditched the city and went country, visit our website, urbanexodus.com. Stay tuned next week for my conversation with Richard Blanco. Richard is a world-renowned poet and writer. He was selected to write and read his poem, One Today, at President Obama's 2013 inauguration. Richard credits his move to rural Maine with providing him the inspiration and solace to write his inspiring poem that moved the nation. In our conversation, we talk about the pursuit of home, his writing process, and what he has learned about himself after moving to the country. Urban Exodus is a tremendous labor of love. If you like the content we create, please consider supporting our efforts on Patreon. And if you're a small business and would like to sponsor an episode, please visit our podcast page on our website to learn more. An enormous thank you to my incredible team that have helped make this podcast possible. Production by Simone Leon, editing and writing by Ari Snyder, and music by Benjamin Bethurum. I'm Alyssa Hessler, and this is The Urban Exodus. Stay joyful, stay kind, stay resilient. Stay resilient.